In Module 1, we looked at the first and second order partial derivatives. In this module, we'll apply those functions to multivariate optimization. We'll examine the necessary first order conditions for stationary points. Then we'll look at the sufficient second order conditions for global extreme points. In Module 3, we'll cover the necessary and sufficient conditions for local extrema. We'll look at the extreme value theorem and the procedure for classifying all extreme points. The necessary conditions for interior extreme points are analogous to the univariate case. Internal extreme points, either maxima or minima, are stationary points. In the case of a function of two variables, both the first order derivatives are equal to zero at a stationary point. These are the necessary conditions, but not the sufficient conditions, because not all stationary points are extreme points, as we'll see in Module 3. So if we have a stationary point at x0, y0, when we evaluate our first partial derivatives for the values x0, y0, then they'll both be equal to zero. Of course, we find the stationary points by first finding the first partial derivatives, setting them equal to zero, and then solving for x and y. We can see why we need both these conditions by looking at this diagram. Recall with partial derivatives, we hold one variable constant. So let's look at del f del y with x equal to x0. In other words, we're looking at the slope of this line here. The function reaches a maximum at point p. We can do the same thing for del f del x with y equal to y0. In this case, we're looking at this line. I think we can again see that the tangent of that line is horizontal at point p, and we have a maximum. We can see that we need both of these conditions if we consider del f del y at, well, not x0, but some other value, say x1. The slope would follow this line. We can see that a tangent at the maximum point of the line is horizontal. Del f del y is equal to zero at that point. But what about del f del x? Recall del f del x is the slope of this line. We can see that del f del x is negative at that point. So when only one of these conditions is met, namely that the first partials are equal to zero, the function won't be at an extreme point. Now let's look at an example of finding the stationary points of a function. We have a cost function here for two goods A and B. Before we go on, let's have a quick look at this cost function. There are fixed costs. When both x and y are equal to zero, there's still costs there. The cost of producing one good, say A, increases in a nonlinear way. So as x increases, so the second term, 0.04x squared, becomes more important. And so we have increasing marginal costs. Similarly with y. There's also an interaction term there. That means there are extra costs involved in producing both A and B. Perhaps the process becomes more complicated and therefore more costly in some way. The firm wants to maximise profit. We'll find the profit maximising values of X and Y by first finding the stationary points. We have our cost function. The prices of goods A and B are 15 and 9 respectively. Profit is simply revenue minus costs. Revenue is 15 times the quantity of A produced plus 9 times the quantity of B produced. And we subtract our cost function. Always be careful with the signs when you're subtracting. We can simplify that. Now we have the profit function. Our next step is to find the stationary points. The first order conditions for finding stationary points are del pi del x equals zero and del pi del y is equal to zero. Here's our profit function once again. Del pi del x will equal, well that'll be 11 minus 0.08x. We treat y as a constant, so the first root of, with respect to x of these two terms is zero. It'll be minus 0.01y, and our constant disappears. But that equals zero, we'll call that equation one. Similarly, del pi del y will equal 7 minus 0.02y minus 0.01x. Let that equal to 0. Call that equation 2. Let's get the equation 2 in a more useful form. We'll have 700 minus 
2y minus x equals 0, simply multiplying through by 100. This implies x equals 700 minus 2y. We'll call that 3. We'll substitute 3 into equation 1. So now we have an equation in y, so we can solve for y. Simplifying further, and dividing through by 0.15, y, we'll call that y naught, is equal to 300. x naught will equal, what, 700 minus 2 times y naught, and that equals 100. So we find that we have one stationary point at x equals 100, y equals 300. Perhaps we could assume that that's a maximum point, but remember the B2 bomber from lecture 4. In order to prove that this is in fact a maximum, we now need to think about the second order conditions. Before we do that, we need to introduce a new concept, namely that of a convex set. For a function of two variables, the domain in the xy plane has to be the proper shape. That is, the domain has to be a convex set of x and y. This is a convex set. And this is a non-convex set. I think you should be able to see if the domain is non-convex like this, with strange shapes here, it will cause problems in finding the extreme points. So the domain of our function in the xy plane has to be a convex set. That's part of our definition for the sufficient conditions. We need a convex set in the xy plane, or the r squared plane. We have a little bit more maths jargon here, a C2 function, f of x. This simply means that all the partial derivatives up to order 2 exist and are continuous. We have the general definition down here. So we have a point, x0, y0, that's an interior stationary point in a convex set S, which we're assuming is the domain of the function. Let's look at the conditions for a maximum. If x0, y0 is a maximum, then f11 prime prime and f22 prime prime, the second order partials, are both less than or equal to zero. That's quite straightforward. For the case of a minimum, both these partials are greater than or equal to zero, and these two conditions are analogous to the univariate case. There's also one more condition, which is the same for both cases. We'll see the reason for this condition when we discuss local extreme points in Module 3. For now, we'll just consider when this condition is met. If we have a maximum, then the product in the first term, both these values are negative, so the first term there will be positive. In order for this condition to be greater than or equal to zero, then the squared term must be small compared to the first term. Let's look at the intuition behind these conditions. Let's consider f11 prime prime and f22 prime prime first. Recall that the slope of this line is f2 prime. So the slope goes from positive to negative. F22 prime prime, the way that F2 prime changes, is going to be less than or equal to zero. And similarly for the slope when we're holding Y constant. So if these conditions hold over the domain of the function, then our function is likely to be concave. But nevertheless, we need to consider that third condition. The simple explanation of why we need this condition is that the other two conditions only tell us how the function changes in two directions, namely, parallel to the x-axis and parallel to the y-axis. This term tells us if strange things are happening in other directions. We'll come back to this condition in Module 3, but for now, let's think about what the mixed partials mean. F21 can also be written as del del x of del f del y. So what we're looking at is how del f del y changes as x changes. Again, we could think about a small change in x, I think you can imagine in this case, if we have a small change in x, then the slope of the function with respect to y only changes slightly. Back to the second order conditions. What we note is that if the convex set S is the domain of the function, then these conditions tell us about the shape of the function over the domain. Namely, if the conditions in A hold, then our function is concave over the domain. If the conditions in B hold, then our function is convex over the domain. It's important to remember that these conditions hold for all x and y in S. That's why we have non-strict inequalities here and here. The reason that the inequalities are 
non-strict, it's possible that the slope in one direction might be linear. For example, if we held y constant, y equals y1, looking at a cross section with the slope del f del x, we could have a linear part to the function. In this case, del squared f del x squared is less than or equal to zero because in this part, our del f del x is equal to some constant. So the second derivative in that part would be equal to zero. We put all that together in this slide. If we have a twice differentiable function that satisfies the inequalities in A, and this is important throughout the convex set or throughout the domain, then our function is a concave function. On the other hand, if it satisfies the inequalities in B throughout the set, it's a convex function. Now, if we have a concave function and we have a stationary point, we know that stationary point is going to be a global maximum. If we have a convex function and we have a stationary point, then we know that stationary point is going to be a global minimum. Now let's go back to example 5 and apply the second order conditions. First we have the second order conditions for a concave function and hence a global maximum. And also the second order conditions for pi being convex and so x0, y0 being a global minimum. We should always state the conditions. It's a test. So we say what the test is, carry out the test and then state the conclusions. We have our first partials there. So del squared pi del x squared will equal, well, that'll just equal minus 0 0.008. A del squared pi del y squared will equal minus 0 0.02. Del squared pi del x del y is equal to del squared pi del y del x and is equal to minus 0 0.01. Both of these second order partials are negative. Let's look at the third condition. That's equal to minus 0 0.08 times minus 0 0.02 minus or bracket minus 0 0.01 all squared that's equal to 0 0.0016 minus 0 0.0001 and that's equal to 0 0.0015. Well, that's greater than zero. As we saw, the first two conditions held, so they're less than zero. So we conclude that our function pi of x and y is concave for x greater than or equal to zero and y greater than or equal to zero. That was our domain. This implies that x naught y naught equal to 100, 300 is a global maximum. Now go to example 6 to work through a similar problem from start to finish.